This time I got a DAT machine. I'm told not to load a tape because it's going to eat it. This is a more modern Sony, a good one. And this is going to require the mechanism to come apart because there's some pretty common faults on this particular chassis. If you've got one of this design, it's going to need this work. Check it out. This time I have a Sony PC-MR300. This is a DAT recorder, obviously. And this one here, the letter that came with it cautioning me not to put a tape in because it's going to eat it. So that means we're going to take this thing apart and see what's wrong with it. This machine featured super bit mapping, whatever that was, on the DAT format. And your regular controls supported 48 kilohertz, 44.1 in the standard mode, and the 32 kilohertz long play mode. You could select your ID mode, start, skip, or end, write ID to it, rewrite ID. Analog level control over the front here. And on the other side, your, your basic transport controls. This machine is not built to the same degree that the ES machines were built. In fact, this machine looks pretty much like all the other consumer machines. It's got this little daughter board over here. This might be the super bit mapping. I haven't really done much research on that. And here's the transport over here that we're going to be looking at before putting a tape in. I'm going to pull the transport out. We're going to put it through its paces. First things first, I'm going to open the tape door and remove the front cover of the door so that I can remove the deck. I think that had to come off. And we'll power it down. This almost looks like an afterthought, the ground wire. Four screws remove the deck and it just plugs in with a couple of plugs onto the main board. Unplug that. All right, now I can check the, the transport out away from the rest of the machine. We love to hate this chassis. It's all mechanical. It's driven by, there's a loading motor over here. This motor here is what threads and unthreads the mechanism. There's a solenoid here that releases the brake. I don't know if you can see the brake down here, but there's a little brake lever, a little brake pad there that stops the motor. But when it's in the release position, this should turn freely and it's not. It's, it's binding. So the mechanism itself is gummed up. So to get at that, I have to completely disassemble it. We're going to start by removing the actual cassette loader that's held in place by four small screws. So we'll remove these ones. Get the fun part of putting this back together when it's done. But it's really necessary to remove this just because it's in the way. So we'll just set that away, out of the way. And that piece, 
and now we've got the mechanism here to deal with. We got to pull the bottom off of this as well. So we'll pull off the circuit board. Should do these plugs. Move the switch assembly, just so I don't have to unplug it. Okay, now I can swing this board out of the way. Because then you get below the, uh, the, the, the motor or the deck itself to get to the gears down here. Because we're going to have some gears that are gummed up. I can remove the drive belt. Actually, I probably don't need to because it's on the same chassis that's going to come out, if I'm not mistaken. This whole chassis just lifts right out. See, this whole mechanism should move without any resistance whatsoever, and I can barely turn it by hand. This is also the mechanism that you don't want to use the, uh, the data tapes on, because... Uh, See, it's all stuck. It's the grease on these gears that's stuck up. Um, the, the, this, this part of the mechanism should be okay. Yeah, see, the guides move fine. Right, it's just a simple slide mechanism. There's a couple pin switches on here that determine what position it's in. Uh, I think they're on this board here. Are they, oh, they're on a whole separate board right over here. These are little pin switches here to get dirty. They need to be cleaned up. But this is where the fault is, is on this motor block. This um, should turn nice and easy and it doesn't. And it doesn't because the grease has dried up on these gears. So we'll take off this one gear here first. Or these ones for as far as turning. Just release the brakes here and see how the, the reels turn good. Yeah, the reels are nice and, nice and easy to turn. But these ones here are gummed up. I believe it's this one here that gets the, gets the brunt of it. It's this white gear here. It gets all gummed up. And it 
it should just lift off because it's being held in place by this other gear. This gear is what holds it in place. So by removing that one, this one should just lift off. But the problem is the grease here is so dry, so you can barely turn it. I'm going to put some alcohol on here just to try to dissolve that grease a bit. One has to be really super careful if you're going to try to pry this up because this nylon gear is brittle. It will shatter with no warning, so you can't really put much in, in terms of any force on it. You've got to dissolve the old grease out and carefully lift that gear out of place to not break it because getting one of these today, unless you're going to make your own, it's going to be like finding a needle in a haystack. That's a little better. Now you'll see what I mean. All the grease on here is just dried up. So we gotta clean all this off. that up. And now this spins nice and freely with no resistance whatsoever. And I put a little bit of uh, lubricant on here just so that it keeps it fresh for a while anyway. That's the brake that stops it. You see these are loose because this one adjusts the tape tension. We're not going to touch that, but um, I've had these screws come loose on them before. I had I had one, a deck like this. I, I sold it for $50, believe it or not. I sold a DAT machine for 50 bucks years ago. Little did I know what some suckers were paying for them. But I had one just like this and I got tired of it because I got tape to change here. I got tired of it because it could not use the computer grade DDS tapes that I was using. I was using the longer tapes that would give me three hours and this transport used to always chew them up. So I dumped it and got one that did support the longer, thinner tapes. I'm going to use a little bit of Molly Coat grease onto the post here. some on the other ones as well even though they're not uh, they're not gummed up and they're plastic posts well, still won't hurt to put a little bit on there so we'll throw a little bit of grease on all the all the gears oops I hope if I put the right one on the right place this one goes on here
There we go. That turns nice and freely now. So I can put the chassis pack in place. There's no resistance when it's installed. It'll just drop into place. Oh, it goes back on. There's no tensioners or anything. It's it's got uh, uh, quite a deep pulley, so it's not going to fall off. At least it shouldn't fall off. All right, we'll get the wires back pulled around here again. And these have got sensors on here. There's rotation sensors on here that detect these silver stripes on the re reels. That's how it detects if the tape is moving or not. Right, there's photo sensors over here. On the other side here, we got to make sure that uh, these wires are tucked up because other, if they're not pulled into place, they could make contact with the capstan motor and stop it from turning. And uh, I don't know if they can hit the drum on this one or not. I don't think they can. No, the drum motor doesn't doesn't go through, but they could. If there's wires sticking down, they could contact the capstan motor, and that's why there's little clips up here that hold the wires in place, just to make sure that they're they're tucked in. And then we'll plug these other plugs back in at the back here.
detection switches back up and put them in place. This is what detects what type of tape you've put into it. Whether it's a, a thin tape or a long tape. And whether the um, whether the tape, well first of all it detects that there's a tape in place. And then it detects if the um, uh, record tab is set and what type of tape it is. Because there were different thicknesses of tape. That's used to calculate out the um, time remaining. Head drum spins nice and freely. How about the capstan motor? How is it turning? It should turn freely too. Let me just see here. Yep. Yeah, it turns freely. Nothing jamming that. Uh, we can run the mechanism through its paces here from the back. As you can see, the guides go into place and it ejects or unloads. That's how the guides work on this. It laces the tape 90 degrees so the tape comes along across here like this and it's only in contact with the head for 90 degrees, unlike a VCR which did a 180 degree wrap. That didn't need that because it rode at a faster speed than the tape was moving so it could store in memory the information until the next head got into position and then it would write it out to tape. So the tape was only in contact with the head for 50% of its, of its time. Optical sensors here on each end. This is for tape end detection. And there's no, there's no binding on any of these, so that's good. I think I probably will clean these switches here. These are the ones that detect the position that the mechanism is in. So we're going to remove these screws so I can lift this board out of here and just give these switches a, a, a workout, give them some cleaner. Because it's quite a known problem on these machines that these little pin switches give us trouble. So that lifts off and here's the two switches I'm talking about. These two pin switches here I'm just going to uh, get these out of the way and give them a shot of cleaner. So I'm going to grab some contact cleaner. Now how these switches work, if you watch when I run the mechanism up, you'll see the, the main cam down here, the slide. It has little lobes on it that tell the switches, that move the switches one position or the other. So it knows as it gets into loading position, it knows which which switch is activated. That's how it does it.
oops, I don't want this mechanism to fall apart. It's pain in the ass to put back together. But it will. It will fall apart if we're not careful. That's what it does, it kicks the tape out. See? Open and close. There's two more pin switches back here which sometimes give us headaches. These ones on the back here. check the loading mechanism operation we can throw a tape in and it lowers down and opens up the lid everything's looking good there okay let's reinstall this into the box and uh, fire it up and see what it does should work now the preamp might need to be done on this Some of these needed caps in them. I don't oh, see anything in here. It might, it might have some bad caps. Uh, quite often they did, but we'll see how it sounds before I do. Before I get into that, you can normally tell right away because they sound bad. Bad is in severely distorted, so there's no mistaking bad caps in the preamp because there's like 20% distortion. You know if they're bad. easy enough to pull the deck out again if I have to get at the preamp. Actually, I don't even think i got to pull the deck to get to the preamp, but I'll put in one screw just to hold it in place while I'm testing. I think that answers our question. It works. I'm going to put on some uh, my royalty free tape here just so that I can play it. These have nice displays on them. That's one thing I always liked about these, was the vacuum display looks so nice. Not saying that my Tascams don't look nice, but uh, 
This one looks nice. It's like a dot matrix, but it's not really. I don't think it is a dot matrix on here. Well, it was a dot matrix, but they don't display anything other than it might be alphanumeric. It is an alphanumeric display on here. You can see it, the matrix, but it's single digits, right? Very simple mechanism. This was probably one of Sony's simpler mechanisms. Not a hell of a lot to go wrong on this because there's no guide posts or anything, it's just the pins, right? It doesn't have the angle posts like some of the others did. This has just got two pins, two guides. They can be adjusted, but they typically don't uh, go out of adjustment on these ones. Note the head cleaner. See, even Sony got smart and took out those stupid foam rollers and actually put, it's a plastic scraper. That's how your fingernail works on video heads. Something that we had been doing for years, years, yet the companies went with those stupid rollers and then someone got smart and thought, you know, what about a plastic scraper? Because the DAT machines, being metal tape like Visa, like uh, eight millimeter, you can't clean it with alcohol. It won't do anything. Alcohol will not dissolve metal particles that fuse over the head. And that's essentially what happens when you have a tape that sheds its coating. The, the metal particles will actually fuse to the surface of the head itself and the only way to remove it is to basically file it off which is what a cleaning tape does. A, a dry cleaning tape is mildly abrasive and it files the surface of the heads. Of course in the process of doing that it also removes some of the material from the heads so if you use a cleaning tape too much you will wear down the heads. Finally, they got smart and they put this system in. Watch when it operates. Uh, I think it might only do it. Does it do it when I stop? I think it only does it when I eject. There you go. You see? And then when you load the tape. Isn't that neat? That's got to be the coolest cleaner I've seen on any of the machines. And they finally got it right because that's not going to damage your heads, but it is going to clear off any debris, which is exactly what your fingernail does when you put your fingernail up. It's just the right hardness. This is not super hard plastic, but it's not super soft plastic either. So it's just the right hardness that when it is placed up against the rotating head, the head rotating this way, it scrapes the edge of the, the, uh, the head drum and it scrapes the heads themselves and clears them off. I think that's brilliant. The EVS 7000 High 8 deck has a system that's similar. It's a wheel, but it's made up of little plastic spikes like that, and it works like a hot dam. You know, again, they, they got it right, right near the end of tape. They finally got it right. Anyway, this one here seems to be okay. I'm debating whether I should pull the head preamp out and recap it or not. Maybe we can check them. I'll pull the, I'll pull the preamp out and we'll uh, just take a look at them and see if they're if the, if the caps are getting out of spec. If they're not out of spec, I'm not gonna touch them just because why reinvent the wheel? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's why I always, that's my motto. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You're opening another can of worms if you start getting in there changing things out for the hell of it. See, this may have been made after the uh, after the capacitor plague.
I gotta unsolder it to do that. And we'll see what they look like. If the ESR is going a bit bad on them, maybe we'll change them out. But I'm not one for uh, just going in and changing out a bunch of caps for the sake of it because not everyone is going to fail. And the surface mounted ones were a pain in the ass because there were so many failures on them over the years, but they did finally fix the problem of the leakage. One point four ohms. Four point one. These are twenty two microfarad at six. So twenty two microfarad at ten volts, five point four would be considered to be good. So we're we're under that. 1.1 right uh, I don't think there's any problem with any of these caps that I've tested in here yeah these are all okay there's no there's no sign of any leakage on here right I mean they, they, there were bad caps but they they fixed that problem and this is looking to be one that was after the problem was resolved so I'm not going to bother changing these out they're not bad I know someone's going to say well you're in there why don't you change them anyway that's the same reason why, you know, I had my car being worked on. Well, this is not the current car. This is like two cars ago. But um, I took my car into a mechanic for a, uh, a cooling leak. It had been there since day one. It's one of the reasons I don't drive Fords anymore. Because I think Fords are a piece of crap. At least the ones I've had lately have been a piece of junk. But... Um, this car had a coolant leak from the time that I got it. It went back to the, the dealer um, about six times. And every time it went back to the dealer, they couldn't find where the coolant was leaking. They topped it up and sent me on my merry way. And I got tired of going back to the dealer because, uh, while well, the dealer could never find anything wrong with it, for one. But two, the dealer would never give me a vehicle to drive while they were working on it and it was a dealer that was a long ways from where I lived the opposite direction from where I worked and getting the car to them so that they could tell me there was nothing wrong with it was a real pain because I had to arrange to get a ride first of all I had to get my wife to come and get me at the dealer and bring me back so that I could go to work and I had to be at work at 9 in the morning and I had to be at the car dealership at 8 so I had to fight rush hour traffic to get to the dealership at 8 o'clock and they would not give me a loaner. They said they didn't have one, uh, but uh, they wouldn't give me a rental or anything. And I had to get there and take it and drop it off and they'd have it a day or two and then tell me that there was nothing wrong with it. Or that they fixed something and uh, it was, the problem was fixed, which they never did because, well, it leaked again. It came up with low coolant. I kept having to top it up. That was the problem. And um, finally I got tired of dealing with them and I went to an independent mechanic. And the independent mechanic says, oh, we found the problem. It's your cam cover gasket is leaking. And uh, we're going to replace the cam cover gasket. But while we're in there, we should change the timing chain. Why? Well, we're in there. Well, how much is that? Oh, it's not that much. Well, how much is that? Well, the timing chain's only $200. I said, well, the vehicle had, I think, maybe 50,000 miles on it. I said, you know, a timing chain is not worn out in 50,000 miles, so don't change it. If the cam cover is leaking because you're telling me that your experts had diagnosed that and you, you, you see it leaking, we'll change the, the gasket. So they changed the gasket and charged me, I don't know, $1,200 to change the gasket. Three days later, I had low coolant again. I went back to them. And they said, oh, well, um, well, we, we found the leak. So I said to the guys, well, obviously you didn't find the leak because it's still leaking. And then they wanted to pull the top of the engine off to check it. And they wanted to bill me again for it. And I said, you know what? Um, I should have gone to the credit card company and just reverse charges on it and let them fight let them fight me over it in court is what I should have done, but uh, I didn't. Um, I uh, went to the local auto parts place and I bought myself a, a jar of bars leak, if you know what that is. It's like, it's like little filings that you pour into your radiator and they seal up leaks. And that made the problem go away. 
It never leaked again for the rest of the time I was driving the vehicle. The vehicle I've still got. It's uh, one of these days my son will end up with it, I'm sure. And he can have fun with it because it's a, it's a collector car. And it's, uh, it's old. It's like a 1995. But um, it's all original and it was the last one that they made. The last model year that they made that specific model. It's a Thunderbird. Super Coupe. They didn't make very many of them. If any of you car buffs out there, look that one up. Look up the Super Coupe. The Ford Thunderbird Super Coupe. The one I've got's got an automatic transmission in it. I wish it had this five speed. That it would be that much more valuable. But uh, the one I've got's got the four speed auto. Um, the Super Coupe they only made uh, the last year they made it was 1995, and they only made uh, I think 4,100 of them with the automatic transmission. Now, had I got one with the five speed, they only made 515. So you can imagine how much more valuable the model with only 515 ever built would be worth. But the one that I've got is certainly a collector car. Not very powerful by today's standards. Has a 3.8 V6 supercharged engine. Turns out about oh, 250 horsepower. So it's not it's not record setting horsepower like today. But it goes like stink. It was a blast to drive. And it's quite a unique color. It's a paint that changes color called Chameleon Blue. Only available on uh, four models that Ford made in 1995. The Thunderbird, the Cougar, the Probe, and the Windstar Van. Were the, only, the only four vehicles that came factory with that color. And it was a very expensive color. I didn't, I didn't order it, believe me. I bought the car in 95. Actually, I think I bought it in 96. Because I got a good deal on it. Because somebody had ordered the car, they'd custom ordered that car of that color and paid, I think, $8,000 for the paint. It was a, that's how expensive that paint was, seven or 8000 bucks for that special paint job that they'd ordered on this car and uh, had the car built for them. And once the car was delivered, they never took delivery of it. Had to run and change another tape there. I'm doing a, a bunch of tapes for a uh, a former hockey player. I'm not going to mention his name for privacy reasons, but um, let's just say he's got every game that he ever played in at both the professional and the junior level has been uh, recorded. So I've been digitizing all these tapes to a hard drive and then when I thought I was done they found more tapes of his junior games and then his, his mother found some more tapes so this has been something I've been working on for the past month there's been like 40 40 odd or well, more than 40 tapes I think probably yeah probably close to 40 40 45 tapes but most of them have been like five to six hours long each so I've been uh, keeping me busy. That's when you hear a timer go off and start beeping. That's to remind me that I've got to uh, go and change the tape. I'm down to the last three, I think, now. I started on these uh, back at the beginning of December, so it's been, it's been a big job. Some of them are shorter, some of them are longer. The last couple ones I've done have only been like two and a half hours. So they've been a little little easier to manage. All right, time to uh, test this thing once again. Let's plug it in. Cover back on. Go we'll check the search out here, and they should be able to hit AMS and go to the next track. Not 
works. Next track forward. Go back a couple tracks, I'll go back two tracks. That's working. Okay, I guess this one is done. If I can find a tape to record on, we'll do a recording test and then I'll call it a day. Got it set to record. I only got about 30 seconds of tape left on the end here, so we'll just hit record. I already get the level set. We'll hit play and I'll get to my next track here. So there we go. I'll set this record here for just until the tape runs out. Just the tail end of the tape. Just to verify that it's going to record. the end of the tape so we'll just play this back go back to cue it back here I guess I could do this I could do that and that would take me back to the starting point I think I missed the beginning here I started a little bit yeah I missed the beginning oh well I, I was slow at hitting the button and that's in the 32 kilohertz mode too long play by the time it's two seconds right anyway this one's fixed Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.